Hello, it's Sunday, sort of. Not really sunny outside anymore, but it still counts, which means it's another Insta Church, uh, the place where I openly admit that I hope to fail up. <laughs> um, how many of you, talking to myself, uh, during this last week of quarantine have quarreled with those in your household or family, friends, if you're not living completely alone, quarreling with yourself, who knows? My hand goes up, my hand goes up. Um, we live in a world where, especially, oddly, uh, when we're with those that we are closest to, love the most, uh, we often quarrel. And I feel like it was a good time to talk about moral relativism and its offspring. Uh, moral relativism, meaning to each his own. Like, uh, uh, whatever's good for you is good for you. Whatever's good for me is good for me. And uh, we'll see what happens when we take it to its end. And, uh, and see if maybe possibly there is a higher way or a healthier way to live life. Um, we obviously live in a world full of conflict. Free will exists. Everybody can choose to be who or what they want to be. And not everybody ascribes to the same moral standard of good. So, so therein lies the problem. Like we all have to be our own kind of barometer of um, how to treat one another, what's right and wrong, how I wish to be treated versus how you treat me. And, and so relationally, interrelationally, we see conflict arise. And for most of us, that never becomes too destructive. I mean, yes, you can look at our society today and see that like suicide rates are through the roof and anxiety or you know, opioid crisis. Everybody's trying to kill the pain, dull the senses to, uh, to, 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 to achieve some state of altered consciousness through any means necessary, uh, uh, seeking comfort at all cost. Um, and, and, and perhaps, um, Perhaps if we ex explore um, a, a, a time and place where that kind of um, moral relativism that leads to pacifism and leads to appeasement um, was taken to uh, a, to, a, to an extreme and see what that looks like. Um, so I'll start with, um, so I've got a quote here. This takes us back to January 20th, 1940. During a speech... Winston Churchill gave, uh, he said this, each one hopes that if he feeds the crocodile enough, the crocodile will eat him last. All of them hope that the storm will pass before their turn comes to be devoured. But I fear greatly that the storm will not pass. It will rage and it will roar ever more loudly, ever more widely. That was, that was a, a, a public speech that he was giving in the hopes of rousing allied forces around the world to help him put a stop to the campaign that Nazi Germany had been waging against Poland and Czechoslovakia and what he saw as soon to be something that spread to the north, south, east, and west, something that would not stop. He was also speaking to a people that had grown um, concerned with this idea of appeasement, with this peaceful approach uh, towards pacifying evil. And you can appeal to the law of nature, um, this innate law uh, that abides in all of us that says that, uh, you know, um, taking an innocent life is, um, is not right. When you look at uh, Mein Kampf in 1923, Hitler's writing where he describes how he envisions a world where he wipes uh, an entire people, the Jewish people, off the map. This was a goal of his for years. Um, this was well known. Um, Neville Chamberlain, uh, the British Prime Minister that preceded Winston Churchill, took on a policy of uh, pacifism and appeasement and 
essentially made a deal with the devil. I mean, them all knowing what his goals were. He had, he had also uh, uh, talked about how he saw a global war happening in the future. Um, he visited Hitler. He came away saying he's a fine gentleman, <laughs> fine gentleman. Um, Hitler made no qualms about admitting what he wanted. It was world domination and the elimination of a people. He wanted to create a super race, uh, the Ubermensch. Um, this, in his words, like a purified Aryan nation. And uh, he, he was willing to ruthlessly go after that goal. Um, Neville Chamberlain, wanting peace, understandably, um, decided to make a pact with him. And part of what Hitler wanted was a portion of uh, Czechoslovakia, um, Sudan, Finland. And, uh, and so, so, so part of this agreement was, okay, we'll give you what you're asking for so that you don't have to go nuts and go like invading everybody. Like, we'll just kind of give it to you. And that backfired because what Hitler saw was a lack of desire for people to stand up uh, to what he was doing. He took it as permission to go forward ruthlessly, right? He made another agreement, Hitler, with the Soviet Union, uh, the Non-Aggression Act that said um, um, basically for 10 years, the Soviet Union and Germany would take no military action against each other. So Hitler's saying, look, things are going to get nuts and I'm going to go crazy over here in Europe. And Soviet Union saying like, okay, Okay, let me appease you. Let me pacify you. As long as you don't hurt us. Winston Churchill saying, like, feed the crocodiles. Like, you can have, you know, uh, Italy and France, and you can have all them. Go for it. Just don't eat us. Okay, yeah, sure. When, when you take moral relativism, like, what, as long as that's good for you, it's good for me. Which breeds passivism. Which breeds a passivism with evil, I should say, um, uh, breeds appeasement, breeds the death of 70 million people. Ironically, if you look at the statistics, which countries lost the most, had the most casualties? Ironically, it's the Soviet Union with an estimated 27 million people dead, and they were the ones that signed a pact of peace with Germany. I would argue you cannot make a deal with the devil. That when we see and confront evil in the world, that it will always cost us more to appease it, to pacify it, to say, as long as it doesn't affect me, then it does to stand up to it and cut it out like we treat cancer like we treat the coronavirus, where we quarantine, we're at the risk of world economies, uh, children's education, the health of um, frontline workers, uh, uh, to communities, to career, to, to ambitions and dreams and business, and sh TV shows, whatever, everything's, all, it's all fair game. We must stop this thing so that we can save lives. But if we can take that kind of approach to cancer or coronavirus or other things in this world, and not to uh, an objective evil, um, then we will leave ourselves um, infected with something that is far costlier than we would ever hope. So if, if we have within our history, our, our, our close history, um, the loss of such life, 70 million people. Okay, so moral relativism, maybe it doesn't work. You know, maybe I'm just used to seeing it on small scales throughout the day where I just get a little frustrated or whatever, but like, okay, okay, so if, if we do take it to its end, it is, it, it, it leads us to a uh, death of the worst order. What's the alternative? I would suggest the alternative to this religion of moral relativism to each his own is ethical monotheism. Where do we find that idea? That idea is rooted in the Torah. Uh, you know, the first five books of the, the Old Testament, um, a revolutionary work of literature where you get ideas like there is one God, 
this God is something that created nature, therefore is outside of time and space in nature, an eternal sex, sexless God, um, that demands a standard of good that's universal to all creation, that all are, are considered one and expected to obey because through that obedience springs life. This is a God who is ultimately good and just. And these ideas of the, this, these laws of nature are in us, which is how across all time and all cultures, we can share this general sense of right and wrong, regardless of our religious beliefs. There's something deep inside of us and that comes from the fabric of our creator, which is in all of us. So, so we look at the Torah, we look at the Old Testament, and we see this idea of ethical monotheism, the revolutionary idea, and that can get very confusing because what you also see juxtaposed with that, which I might add, is the very reason I, I believe the Torah, the Old Testament, Scripture, is something that was authored um, beyond just simply the hand of man because it, 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 it doesn't cast the protagonist in uh, glowing light all the time. In fact, it's rather, uh, it's rather jarring to read how the Israelites, um, God's people, are uh, written about in many ways. That you've got a God that would allow himself to be discussed and cast in, in this light of what some people would describe as like a bloodthirsty warrior God. The, the challenges that that poses, I feel, if we really dig, are a feature, not a flaw. And I think more revealing about the heart of God and what, what we are being called to. Um, in Exodus or in, in Exodus and, and Deuteronomy and number, we, we get in, in lots of places this idea of, of, of kind of like a, 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 um, a God of war um, where we see some passages of destruction. Um, God says, basically, you stand still and I'll fight for you. Uh, it can be hard to look at that kind of ruthlessness and see a loving God, to see a God that jives with the God of the New Testament, Jesus. Jesus says, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. I'm in the Father, the Father is me. If you know me, you know the Father. You know. We are one in the same. There seems to be a huge disconnect. Uh, I wanna help us bridge that gap because if we understand ethical monotheism, we have to understand how to get from one to the other. And I think if we do, something extraordinary can come at the end of that road. If we look at every one of those cases in context where we see a God that is sometimes it's extinguishing entire tribes, cities, towns, calling Israelites to war against others, at the root of it, it is always a war against other gods, against evil. We are looking at the anti-appeasement in action. We have, we have heard, uh, I'm a jealous God. Um, to be slow to anger, rich in kindness, these ideas that leave us questioning kind of who he is, and then we see these, um, these feats of war. If we look at it in context, we see a God who hates evil and does not want to let it spread and take root throughout all people in all time because it is infectious. If you've ever been around a group of people or seen a friend get around a group of people who is, uh, are all into the same things, drugs or you know what, whatever, uh, you know, it my worldly thing it might be, um, um, 
it, 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 it spreads more often than not to that person. You see them becoming, oh, they used to be different. They used to be so nice and now they're lost to this thing. God knows that that spreads and refuses to lose any more than he has to, to, to our own desires. And so ruthlessly stamps out evil. And, and, and the worst order of that is when it's a people that worship other gods. Um, he's first, knows that by being first, life is there for us. And when he's not, death is there. And so it's very hard for us to reconcile this God uh, of war in, in some places that's demanding ethical monotheism. But if we look at World War II, we can maybe understand how we've done the same thing. Eventually stepped in and the Allied forces took down the Axis and after a very costly war uh, and a brutal, sickening Holocaust, um, finally extinguished Hitler and his evil regime. God has done the same thing. So I think we have to be careful to throw out who God is and and script, verses like this, um, God speaking through, this is Ezekiel um, thirty three eleven. God speaking through his prophet says, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? One of my favorite verses in the Bible, Isaiah 1, 18 through 20, another prophet says, come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Their sins are like scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though red like crimson, I'll make them white as wool. If you only obey, you'll have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you'll be devoured by the sword of your enemies. It's not that God desires war or conflict or consequences for us, but he knows that it is an inevitable end. Um, anytime we are trying to exist apart from him. And sometimes that requires him to, especially in that time, um, to squash it like a bug, that kind of evil, because the path to salvation in that day was obedience and there was none that were, that were obedient. And so he needed to make a way to atone for those sins so that it wouldn't have to be a, a cosmic geographic battle of good and evil forever. So we find the person of Jesus. Christ, the invisible God manifest in flesh, comes to live a perfect life, to teach, to serve, to heal, and ultimately to pay that price for us by turning that same ruthless that same ruthless sword of atonement on himself. That same ruthless thing that we, that I deserve, that ruthless end that I deserve for all the disobedience, for all the times I've strayed, ignored God, fallen short, not lived up to the image with which he created me to live, to reign and rule enthusiastically over this, this nature with him, to enjoy it, I haven't done that. I, I spit in his face and I deserve a different end than the one that I get, than the one that I'm offered through the person of Jesus who instead took that ruthless slaughtering that I deserve on himself. And he did the same thing for you and for me. C.S. Lewis says it best when he says, if you were the only person ever to have lived, Christ would have been crucified the same way. He would have done the same thing just for you. That's how important it is to God to be reconciled, to restore humanity and nature, things to the way that they were. And he knows that it's not going to happen through our own obedience because we continually fall short, all of us. And so he found a better way for our sake by turning that ruthless um, need for atonement uh, on himself. A, a spotless lamb, as he's called. So it's not that the Christ of the New Testament is entirely different from the old. They are one and the same. It's just that we see a picture of one laying down his life for us 
in the same brutal fashion. It doesn't always make sense that that's the offering that we get, that we get a God who comes down to atone for us and then we just, what, we just have to accept it. But that's, that's how much God loves us and desires for us and all nature and humanity to be restored. So what then are the messages of Christ? What's Christ calling us to? That's where our work comes in. Yes, we receive this gift, but then what? Then we go to work against the self. The same ruthless, the same ruthlessness that, that, that the God of the Old Testament shows to, to, to people that worship other gods. We still are that same person. We have our own gods and our own idols and we worship something out there aside from God with our time, our treasure, our life. Christ is calling us to go to war with that thing, to pick up a cross and follow him, to crucify those parts of ourselves daily. And when we do that, we will find a life, not death at the end, at the end of that road. So moral relativism leads to world wars, to evil men extinguishing entire races of people, to 70 million people dead. Ethical monotheism leads to a, one God suffering on a cross for our sins so that we might find life through that atonement, for that ransom paid for us. The natural outpouring of, of, of receiving that is that we then begin to, John 3.30 says, he must become greater, I must become less. We go to war against our ego and reduce ourselves. And in the holes that are created in the little deaths every day, to ambition, to desire, to lust, to vengeance. Christ comes to fill those parts of you in this patchwork. Eventually, over time, be you begin to look more and more like Christ, more and more like a God of love, of the Old Testament and the New. I would argue that ethical monotheism leads to Christ that Christ leads to a real full life, that a death does occur, a death on your own cross, a death did occur on a cross to make a way for you, but that when you walk a, a, that life with Christ, a death occurs, but it's not less, you're more. You're more. There's more peace, more love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what, that's what Christ says you get those fruits of the Spirit, all hanging from the same tree. How can that be? We can't imagine a world with eight fruits hanging from the branches, all beautiful and different. That's what we're offered. That's where I'm heading. I hope you'll join me there.